evening. Once again, it is a joy and it is a pleasure to see each of you this wonderful evening that we have been blessed. We are continuing in our studies and looking through the book of Matthew, and we are coming uh, quickly to a, a closure of that, I guess you could say, as we reach that last week that we have been in where we are seeing those last moments, if you will, of Jesus, in this case, as we're going to look at tonight, Jesus' betrayal before the cross, before he is crucified, before he is delivered over to be uh, nailed upon a tree in which he created. We oftentimes think when we consider those last days of Christ, we oftentimes consider the humiliation he went through, being spat upon, being scourged, being bowed before, having a crown of thorns placed upon his head, and those who would say to him, uh, Hail, King of the Jews. We oftentimes, when we think of these last moments, these last times, we think of the, the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. When we think of the scourgings, we think of the, the nailing to the cross, we think of the challenges physically and the difficulties that that created and that established. We think of his death, of course. And obviously we think of the resurrection. But as we're going to look at tonight, we're going to look at what took place prior to all that. What took place with Jesus before all those events began. You see, we find before all of that happened, before all of that started, that Jesus was betrayed by friends and family, wasn't he? And so when we consider this, we're going to look at the first point tonight, and that is Jesus was betrayed by his friends. In our text this evening, Matthew 26, 47 through 75, we will see Jesus being abandoned by those whom he called friends, not just friends, but those he called close friends even. I'm reminded there just not too long before Jesus would be crucified in John 15, 15, when he said to those disciples of his, those apostles, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Notice, but I have called you friends. These are the ones who are with him for these three years. These are the ones who have been challenged by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, by the elders of the Jews. These are the ones who had been through thick and thin as they had seen it up to this point. These were his friends. Some so much so that as we see in the book of John where John calls himself the one whom Jesus loved. And so when we consider this in John 15, 15 that he has called them friends, we need to recognize as we begin this that the first one to betray him was his friend. Judas was not exempted from John 15 and verse 15. I have a hard time in my mind wrapping it around that concept where Jesus, knowing what would take place, could say to the man who would betray him, listen, you're my friend. And yet that's exactly what Jesus did. And so when we think of the betrayal of Judas, as we'll read here in just a moment, keep in mind how Jesus saw him. He didn't just see him as the one there at the Passover, and after uh, having pointed out the betrayal of him, he didn't see him just as his betrayer. He was his friend, his close friend. It sounds odd to say, but nevertheless it was true. In our text in Matthew 26, 47 through 49, we read this. While he was still speaking, that's Jesus, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man sees him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Not only did Judas, Jesus' friend, betray him. Not only did that take place, 
but he did so with a sign of friendship. <clears throat> At this time, as we see in Romans 16, 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, and many other passages, when you greeted one another, you greeted each other with a holy kiss. That was much like, as we would think of the handshake today, where you would greet a good friend, the shake and hug. The, the kiss, or this holy kiss, was that which was an embrace of affection, which said, listen, we are friends. Judas, who was the friend of Christ, betrayed him with such a greeting. One might, and rightfully so, well, it was prophesied, wasn't it, that Judas, or one, and Judas was the case, would, would betray Jesus, so maybe... He wasn't as much of a friend as we might think. This might be all well and good, except we see even Jesus' closest of close friends betrayed him as well. Skipping down a few verses, we're going to look at some of the verses from Matthew 26, 69 through 75. There where Peter, one of the closest friends of Christ, the one who was with him during so many of the monumental moments where it was just him, James, or John, and Andrew. When we see all this close and them together and them so close, and yet in Matthew 26, 69 through 75, we see Jesus, G, Peter excuse me, betrays his Lord and Savior, his friend. Not just his friend, but his good friend. So not only Judas, but Jesus' good friend Peter's response is shocking, isn't it? The one whom Jesus called a friend. Let's look there in Matthew 26 at the three different ways in which Peter responded to Jesus being his friend. It was said, aren't you his friend? But he denied it, verse 70, before them all saying, I do not know what you mean. Verse 72, same request. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. Verse 74, upon the third time of it being asked of him, then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man, and immediately the rooster crowed. Now Matthew's account on this basically ends at this point. But Luke gives us a little bit more information about this account and the close friend that has now betrayed Jesus. It's bad enough that this happened in this way that Peter would do this, but notice what Luke records right after the rooster crowed. And it says, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. It wasn't the rooster that reminded him. And Peter remembered the saying, the Lord. Before Jesus was taken by the Romans, before he was hung upon a tree, before he was crucified, he was betrayed by his friends. You say, well, here's just two examples. You know, just two of his friends we see that betrayed him. And if that wasn't bad enough that Judas and Peter betrayed Jesus, his friends, one being a very close friend of Christ, after Jesus was arrested, notice what Matthew records there in Verse 56, then all the disciples left him and fled. As I mentioned in the beginning, all this took place but before the soldiers would scourge him, before they would mock him, spit on him, and kill him. All of this took place before all of that. Our Lord and Savior was betrayed by those he considered his friends, not just his friends, but his close friends. He was betrayed even by the one whom is said whom he loved. The reality is, as God's children, there is always this chance of happening, isn't it? I would like to say that it would never be the case for those who live righteous lives that their friends will never betray them, but the reality is that that is simply not the case. 
If we strive to live godly lives, as Paul told Timothy, we will suffer persecution. And sometimes that will be our friends. It happened to Paul and Barnabas, didn't it? Remember in Acts 13 and verse 13? Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John, that's John Mark, left them and returned to Jerusalem. Paul felt so betrayed by this that later on, remember, he didn't want to take Mark with him again. And him and Barnabas had somewhat of a falling out there for a moment. Paul dealt with this numerous times in his life. A one, a, a member of his fellow workers in Christ whom he more than once mentioned as a worker with him, a fellow friend, if you will, in the ministry of going out, encouraging, strengthening the congregations. He said of this fellow worker of Christ named Demas, Philemon 24, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, as he writes to another friend, for Demas, in love of this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans have gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. <coughs> this certainly shouldn't be a shock, though, when we consider the realities of walking in the light, is it? Jesus said, if we follow in his footsteps, we will deal with many of the same things that he had to deal with. We're going to have to deal with the persecutions. Man has always, in, a, in his desire, John chapter 3, to be in the dark, has hated the light. And therefore, whether they can, we consider them friends or foes, the reality is that unfortunately, sometimes we're going to be betrayed. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 21 and verse 16. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives, notice, and friends. And some of you they will put to death. There he talks to his disciples, the apostles, saying, listen, the reality is there. It's an unfortunate truth, but it is something that takes place. If we seek righteousness as Jesus was seeking righteousness, if we seek righteousness like Paul and Barnabas and others seek righteousness, there will be times, unfortunately, where we will have to deal with this. Most of the time, I would venture to say outside of the church, but sometimes even in it. It's a sad truth, but once in a while, unfortunately, it does take place. But when we look at the betrayal that Jesus went through, it wasn't just his friends, was it, that betrayed him. It was in reality not just his friends, but his family betrayed him as well. We see there in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 59, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Say, so wait a minute, those weren't his friends, those were his, in or his family, those were his enemies. But we got to remember who they were. In Ezekiel chapter 16, we see the relationship God had with the Israelites, and that's Jesus. No, I pitied you, he said, to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out, God said of Israel, out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you, I saw you wallowing in your blood. I said to you, in your blood, live. I said to you, in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant of the field, and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. You can see the love that God had for his family, the Israelites. And one of the more powerful passages in all of Scripture, we see Jesus as he looks upon Jerusalem who will destroy him. And the people there in his family says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You could replace that by, Oh, family, family, my children. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus was not just betrayed by friends, but he was eventually betrayed by his family and ultimately by them. His family had, physical family had even caused him difficulties, hadn't they? 
Mark 3, 20 and 21, when he went home, it says the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he was out of his mind. You see, when we think of Christ, he wasn't just betrayed in our text tonight by his friends. He was betrayed by his family. Once again, this shouldn't be a shock, though it is hard to take. God told us this could and most likely would happen when we strive for godliness in our lives. He would say it this way in Matthew 10, 35 through 37. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. As Jesus teaches his disciples this, what he's trying to say is, listen, there might be times where you're betrayed by your family. Those who, portray, who say they love you and portray this uh, ideology and thought process of being there for you, they might turn against you. I would venture to say that all of us have had, if not friend and family, one or the other, who knew what was true and knew what was right, having turned their back on righteousness, betrayed us. Knowing what that feels like should be a motivating factor in our lives, shouldn't it? It should motivate us never to go through that. <laughs> And put someone, or never, excuse me, to put somebody else through that because of ourselves. When we think of the life of Christ, he exemplified what it meant to be a humble servant. Who was able to take all of these things and stay yet perfect in them. Though he was betrayed by all, it seemed, his family, his friends, everyone. He did not give up, but said, Father, forgive me. They know not what they do. Though he felt no doubt alone as he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Having taken on the sins of the world, having been betrayed by family and friends, and having for a moment had God had to look away, the Father look away, he still had compassion. He still did what was right. As we look to our Lord and Savior as that great example, let us learn from His betrayal. And though I pray that we never go through anything similar in any form or fashion that He did, I do pray that if we even come to a semblance of it, that we react in the same way. That we live for God and His will. Loving him so much that it doesn't matter what friend, family, <coughs> foe does. It matters what our Father's will is. It matters what our desire for him in our lives is to us. And that we allow that to propel us in our walk with him. As we go throughout this evening, the rest of our lives, as we think of the betrayal that Jesus went through and as we think of the great humiliations, pain, sufferings, and difficulties that he did, let us not forget also the loneliness of it. And let us use that as a factor in our lives to never make God feel that way because of us. Either. Not just with each other, but let us always draw closer to him. Be that friend, John 15, or, uh, 16, 15, or 15, 14, excuse me. Be that friend of his that obeys his commandments. Be that one who is drawing closer to him day by day. Maybe it is the case this evening that there's someone here who's been struggling. Maybe you felt betrayed and were unaware of it. Maybe you felt hurt or whatever the case may be in this. Let us as a family help you. Let us as a family be there for you. I was talking to someone this afternoon who was talking about the difficulties of not having a good physical family. And I said to them, I said, listen, the bonus of being a child of God is, yes, it hurts that your physical family isn't what they ought to be, but God has given you a family to rely on. He's created a family structure by which if our physical families fail us in that area, this family still picks us up, doesn't it? 
still can be there for us, motivate us, train us, and help us to be what we need to be. If there's someone here in need of this family tonight, let us be there for you. Let us help you. Let us not be ones who walk away from you, but let us be there for you. We will not betray you. If there's someone here who needs the prayers of this congregation tonight, let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.